Now, here's a clip I'm going to play from Stan Dale. Uh, he was on a radio show talking about his view of the Garden of Eden. I was putting all these things that are found in these countries on a list, saying which country had all of the above mentioned in the biblical account of the Garden of Eden in Genesis 2, uh, 10 through 14. And what I found was Tanzania had all those goodies. And the river that I had found that made a loop around Madagascar or around the coast between Madagascar and Africa, whichever way it went, the headwater of that those two branches that formed a circle around that land of uh, Tanzania came out of a volcanic field of over 40 volcanoes. And strangely enough, there was a huge riverbed from that same area going all the way down the Great East African Rift to form the other three rivers of the Garden of Eden. They all came to a head at the same place in northern Tanzania in the middle of a huge volcanic field. So that's where he believes the Garden of Eden is. And he had, you know, he's got a, it's a very compelling presentation that he does. I don't agree with his conclusion, but it's still, it's worth watching if you get a chance to uh, look up his Quest for Eden presentation. Even though Stan gives a really good argument for what he believes, I think this, and, and he, these are his uh, views of where the rivers are, I think, at least to me, this makes more sense. Uh, I believe that the white represents the source river. It says it flowed out of Eden and broke off into other branches, right? And I believe for a while, the uh, Gihon in red uh, paralleled or was on top of uh, the source river that flowed from Eden. Uh, and I believe that's why it's the waters of salvation and all the different things that they talk about uh, regarding the Gihon Spring. I believe it came down uh, through the Jordan area and uh, eventually connected with what we now call the Nile. And if you follow the Nile River on a map, it ends pretty much right around here. But you could see that if it was a bigger river at one time, that it could have flowed through the landmass right there and possibly gone here and here, thus circling or encompassing the land of Ethiopia and the Horn of Africa. And I believe if the Source River came down, you know, went up here and fed the, the Hittichel and the Euphrates and uh, uh, came down here through this part of the Red Sea, that little finger right there, and the Pison, if it came in and kind of continued like that, then it might explain these other formations right there, you know. And if the source just kind of continued down to the Gulf of Aden and just circled back around like that, I don't, it's just a theory. That's what I think may have happened. So as I went and looked at this, uh, these possible locations again, I felt, okay, I think I can rule out Tanzania, especially regard, with regard to what I see in the Gihon. And I also think I can rule this one out. There's not much you can really go on other than the name uh, Gulf of Aden. And also this one, and the Gion, I think, is the one that throws that one out of whack. So we have two more candidates left that are, are pretty good candidates, actually, uh, for where the garden could have been. And I found that following Abraham back to the Garden of Eden is the key. Abraham leads us back to the garden. And that came as a result of doing my other timeline, this one here. And I have them here, by the way, if you want to take a look at them. Uh, it's the Nimrod-Abraham timeline, because they, they were contemporaries. And a lot of wild stuff happened <laughs> uh, in that timeline. Why Abraham? You ever wonder why Abraham was called, or Abram was called out of Ur of the Chaldees? You know, why him? You know? Well, he listened, but he's, he's quite a personality, uh, Ab Abram. He's pretty awesome. Nimrod was in the land of Shinar, and he had essentially been made king of the world in 1948. A.M. A.M. being the year since creation. Now... Uh, well, did you guys have some interesting conversations last night after the movie? I, I, I'm just going to say uh, right up front, I have, I have a problem with 1948 Israel. Because as I read Hosea 2, Jeremiah 23, Jeremiah 30, Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 37, Isaiah 66, 8, none of those scriptures fit 1948. Everybody says, look at Isaiah 66, 8. Can a nation be born in a day? Yeah, May 14th, 1948. Well, but chapter 66 is in the context of chapter 65, which is in the millennial reign context. And if you read four verses later, Isaiah 66, 12, it says peace will flow from, like a river from that Israel. Question, have we had peace since 1948? We've had anything but peace. 
And people are like, well, it's the dry bones of Ezekiel 37. I said, okay, let's go look at Ezekiel 37, line by line. Did that happen? No, did that? No, 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 no. So why are we all saying that it did? I do believe there are natural Israelites there, but I believe that it was premature. And I think they're telegraphing who they're serving when they put the statue of Nimrod outside the Hebrew University. And when they <laughs> built the Supreme Court with a pyramid and all-seeing eye and obelisks all over the place and Freemasonry uh, architecture. They're telegraphing who their king is. And it's not Yahuwah. Don't we have the same problem? Well, we have the same problem in America. Yeah, with the Freemasons and the Washington Monument and all that stuff. Uh, and some of you may have heard me tell this earlier, but I'm going to say it again. Because I think with this group right here, we could do some, something kind of cool. Um, how many of you know when you're reading through the Torah and it says when you get in the land, you gotta, they got to tear down all that stuff? The Asher poles, all the Nimrod stuff, right? Get rid of it. Well, you know, growing up in Massachusetts, we went to, down to D.C. a lot. You know, field, field trips and whatnot. I didn't, I mean, I saw stuff, but I didn't see anything, you know. Uh, but then after you take the red pill, <laughs> you know, you see stuff you didn't see before. <laughs> and you see it everywhere. So after doing, you know, Babylon Rising and the mythology, coming Great Deception stuff, uh, Sheila and I went to D.C. We were there for five hours. And we saw some lots of stuff. It's all Nimrod, total pagan. And we came back to our Torah group, and I'm like, ah, take a bulldozer to Washington, D.C. <laughs> you know, we need to take a wrecking ball to that place. You know, I'm like, you know, we got to tear this stuff down, the Asher poles and everything. You know? And uh, Phyllis was an older woman who was sitting right next to me. She goes, no, we need to pray. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but she was right. And um, as a group at Kevin's house, sitting at Kevin and Amanda's uh, kitchen table, it's probably what, 15 of us maybe there at that time, we prayed with intent against the false gods and idols and monuments in our nation. And I kid you not, it was the next day that the earthquake and the, happened and the Washington Monument went boop, <laughs> cracked and they, you know. And the church too. There. Yeah, the church, they had a few problems there too. Uh, of course, then everybody was on Facebook the next day. Rob, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, well, we need to keep praying. You know, FBI, CIA, NSA. I know you're listening right now. I'm not going to take a bulldozer to Washington D.C. <laughs> or a wrecking ball. Did you hear me clearly? <laughs> but I will pray against you. You can take it up with the Huah. Huh? Repent. Repent. Come out of Babylon! <laughs> so I'm going to suggest maybe that we can get together at some point during Sukkot and pray against the stuff in our country. Because we have a lot of it. And who is not pleased with that? Any more than he's not, he's not pleased with what's going on over there either. You know, we have been deceived that we have Christian founding fathers, Right. Oh, our founding fathers are Christians. No, they're not. They're Freemasons. They're deists. They belong to the Hellfire Club, and they have bones under the kitchen. You know, Benjamin Franklin. If you don't know what I'm talking about, look it up. Our founding fathers, yes, our founding fathers were not Christians. The Puritans and Pilgrims, sure. Founding fathers, no. But we have been deceived in this country. Well, I think they're deceived over there, too, because the Rothschilds are not godly people. Neither is the United Nations or the Zionists. And so while I will support Israel, I'm Israel. And I'm going to wait for Messiah to establish the nation. Because my understanding of Scripture, and again, I'm, I'm a toddler here in the Torah. We just finished our fourth cycle. Uh, I read Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 26. It says, if you don't obey him and obey his commandments and do what he says to do, the land is going to vomit you out. And to think that you can set up shop in defiance of that, he gives you grace, he gives you a leash for a little while, then pow! And if, if I read Zephaniah chapter 2, it says, Gather yourselves together, 1948, undesired nation. And then Zechariah 13 says, Two-thirds of that place is going to die. And one-third is going through the fire. And what did Yeshua say? If you're there in the last days, what did he say? Get out! Get out. So how is that the promised land that we're all looking for? I'm, I'm telling my, you know, I'm all for reaching Israel and the Jew. 
and have been privileged to lead a number of Jews to, to their Jewish Messiah. But I'm telling them, don't go there. <laughs> you know, get saved, wait for the Messiah to take you there. Because we're all going to go in together. Um, and I don't think it's a coincidence that Nimrod was made king of the world in 1948 AM. And then in 1948, a state was designed with the star of Remphan, I'm, I'm going to say. Um, but anyway, that's another message. <laughs> I, get, I get riled up about it because I'm passionate about it. Yes, I want to support Israel. Okay, but I'm not going to support Freemasons, Zionists, and a Luciferian New World Order agenda. I'm not going to do it. Um, come out. Well, it just so happened that was the same year that Abram was born. Nimrod was made king of the world, and Abram was born. How many of you have heard of L.A. Marzulli? He wrote a book called The Cosmic Chess Match. And it's a, it's a brilliant concept. It's like you know, God makes a move, the devil makes a move. God makes a move, and he's got playing you know, pieces on the, on the board there. You know? And Nimrod was, I believe, Lucifer's big piece on the, on the board. And he allowed him to do his thing for 48 years or, or so. Uh, actually, he was born in 1908, so he's 40 years uh, when he came to power. And then God put his piece on the board, Abram. This was the same year Abram was born. In fact, Nimrod's evil kingship was part of the reason why Yahuwah called Abram out of Ur of the Chaldees, just south of Babylon, in the first place. We read in Genesis 11, And Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son, Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And they came unto Haran and dwelt there. Okay, so they're... Their plan was to go to Canaan. Why did they stop in Haran? Well, some interesting things when you look into Ur of the Chaldees. The patron god of Ur was a moon god named Sin. <laughs> so Abram was literally called out of Sin <laughs> to go to a place that God would show him. Uh, Sin was the god of the moon in the Mesopotamian mythology of Akkad, Assyria, and Babylonia. Nana is a Sumerian deity, the son of Enlil and Ninlil, and uh, became identified with the Semitic sin. The two chief seats of Nana's sin worship were Ur in the south of Mesopotamia and Haran in the north. Uh, Terra, we learned from the scripture, was an idol worshiper. So all he did was relocate from Nimrod's hanging out in Ur and there's problems there. So he said, well, okay, I still like my, my gods and sin. So I'm going to pack up my family, and we're going to go to Haran. Everything's pretty much the same there, except Nimrod's not there. Uh, Sin is commonly, commonly designated as Enzu, which means Lord of Wisdom. During the period 2600-2400 BC, the Ur exercised a large measure of supremacy over the Euphrates Valley. Sin was naturally regarded as the head of the pantheon. It is to this period that we must trace such designations of Sin as Father of the Gods, chief of the gods, creator of all things, and the like. The quote-unquote wisdom personified by the moon god is likewise an expansion of the science of astronomy or the practice of astrology. His wife was Ningal, the great lady, who bore him Utu, or Shamash, the sun, and Anana, Ishtar, the goddess of the planet Venus. The tendency to centralize the powers of the universe leads to the establishment of the doctrine of a triad consisting of Sin, Nana, and children. We've had some interesting discussions here on Trinity <laughs> uh, around campfires this week. Uh, I'm not going to go there, but anyway. So Terah was an idol worshiper, and he was one of the chief princes of Nimrod, if you read the story. And we see in Joshua 24.2, it talks about uh, Terah serving gods. And uh, we see in Joshua 9 that Terah and his household, you know, uh, he was into making, he had 12 gods of large size made of wood and stone after 12 months of the year, etc., Thus did Terah all his days. So he died an idol worshiper. Now, when you look at the story of Abram, you see that in Genesis 12, Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto the land I will show thee. Now this is what he said. They left Ur, they went to Haran. Get out of there. Leave these guys behind. Keep going. Uh, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee. What is that in reference to? Abraham. Everybody says, you know, bless Israel, curse Israel. 
But I'm not, I says, I will make of thee, thee being Abram, a great nation. Okay. I will bless thee, Abram, and I'll make uh, thy name, Abram's name, great. And thou shalt be a blessing, Abram. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. Anytime I've started talking like I did a minute ago about Israel, they're like, oh, you're cursing Israel. I'm like, no, I'm not. And where do you get that anyway? <laughs> it's talking about Abraham right here, at least in my simple reading of it. Uh, anyway, and these shall be blessed of all the families of the earth, be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their sus substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land into the place of Shechem, unto the plain of Morah. And the Canaanite was in the land, and the Lord appeared unto Abram, and said unto, the, and said, unto thy seed will I give this land, and there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. I'm not going to go into it, but there's a pretty cool story about what Abraham did, or Abram did, to his father's idols. Yeah. Have you heard the story? Yes. It's, it's a, ask me later if you haven't. It's a, it's a cool story. <laughs> um, tell us now. Tell us now? Yeah. All right. Well, I don't want to keep everybody here too long, but okay. Um, <laughs> basically, you know, he was in hiding in a cave uh, for the early part of his years because uh, there was a, a prophecy given right after Abram was born that basically Abraham was, or Abram was going to be the destruction of Nimrod. So Nimrod sort of pulled a Herod, you know, kill all the firstborns in the land. And so uh, Abram was hidden away with Noah and Shem. So he spent about 38 years with Noah and Shem, learning who Yahuwah was from those who would know best, those who came from before the flood, <laughs> right? Then when he came out, and he had learned all this stuff about the one true God, he went home, and Dad's got all these statues of false gods, and he's like, I wonder. So he's laying food out for them to see if they'll eat. You know, having mom cook some real good stuff and laying it out, and nobody's eating anything. So he's getting frustrated by the whole thing. He's thinking, well, maybe it's the sun. So he starts talking to the sun. The sun's not talking back. Maybe it's the moon. No, maybe it's the stars. Nothing's working. So he's testing what he learned with Noah and Shem. Right. Finally, he says, "This is all garbage. My dad made these things. Why are the people worshiping him?" So he takes a hatchet and destroys all the gods except for the biggest one. And he places the hatchet in the hands of the biggest <laughs> idol. <laughs> and dad heard the commotion, you know, and came in and, and, and goes crazy on him. Why did you destroy all my gods and everything? I didn't do it. He did. Look. <laughs> you know? I mean, you got to love Abram. <laughs> he's, just, he's awesome, man. I didn't do it. He did it. He did. There's that, you know, big stupid idol standing there holding the hatchet, right? And, and Tara's like, no, he didn't. He's just made out of wood or stone or whatever. I made it with my own hands. And Abram's like, yeah, hello, McFly. <laughs> Why are you worshiping it then? You know, it made no sense to him. You know? So, I mean, and they just kind of went from, from one crazy situation to another up in Haran. And that's when, when Yahuwah said, look, man, get out and leave dad behind. He actually said leave the family behind too. But he took Lot because he felt guilty. Uh, there's actually another story where uh, uh, Abram was thrown into a fiery furnace. Very similar story to that with you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, and, and, uh, and Haran was in there with him, but Haran got consumed in the fire. So Abram felt guilty because he survived it. And there was one likened to the Son of Man in there with him, protecting Abram. So he felt responsible to raise his brother's son and take care of him. So you understand why he did that. So here's the journey that... Uh, What's that? No good deed goes unpunished. Yeah. yeah. Well, a lot did cause some problems for him, for sure. So he left over the Chaldees, came up through Babylon, up at Nineveh. These are all bad places, right? <laughs> Hangs out here until the father says, get out of there, to Leave your dad behind. And then he came down, and he gets down and stops in Shechem. So I just asked, why Shechem? Why did he stop there? Well, you start looking into Shechem, you find some really cool stuff in the Bible. Shechem was the first plot of land within Canaan owned by the house of Abram. We see in Genesis 33, 18 through 20, that that's the first place they purchased. They actually owned that plot of land in uh, Shechem. Uh, this is where Dinah was raped uh, by Shechem, the man for whom the, uh, the land was named. And of course, Simeon and Levi took vengeance and killed him for it, Genesis 34. 
Uh, this is where we have, Joseph has that dream about the sun, moon, and the stars and everything bowing down to him, right? And his brothers got all mad at him about it. Well, then later, his brothers uh, go off and uh, Jacob is concerned. He's like, he wants to make sure they're okay. So he sends Joseph to go find his brothers, right? And he, they were supposed to be tending the flock in Shechem, but they weren't. And yeah, they went to Dothan. And it says in, in, in uh, Genesis, it just says he met a certain man. Joshua says he met the angel of the Lord. Who's the angel of the Lord? Ah, pre incarnate Yeshua, right? And Yeshua said, well, no, your brothers have gone off to Dothan. Well, the word um, Shechem means diligence. And the word Dothan means double sickness. So they went from a place where they were supposedly diligently caring for the father's flock. Hint, hint. <laughs> into a place of double sickness. And there they were plotting to kill their brother. And eventually, of course, you know, we, they sold him into slavery. Uh, <clears throat> after the Exodus, when the Israelites wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, do you remember the commandment where they had to go in Deuteronomy 11 and Deuteronomy 27? They were told to go to Shechem and divide the Israelite tribes into two groups, right? One on Mount Gerizim and one on Mount Ebal. The blessings on Gerizim and the curses on Ebal, right? Why did they go all wandering around the wilderness, and why did they have to go to Shechem first? Well, again, Jim Staley has a pretty cool insight on that. I'll let you uh, play that for a few minutes here. If you go to Deuteronomy chapter 27, it says this, Then Moshe, Moses, and the elders of Israel charged the people, saying, Keep all the commandments which I command you today. So here it is. So it shall be on the day when you cross the Jordan into the land which the Lord God gives you that day, that you shall set up for yourself large stones and coat them with lime. And write on them all the words of this law, okay, and that word law is Torah, okay. Write on the words of this law, the Torah, which means instructions, when you cross over so that you may enter the land which the Lord God gives you, a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord the God your fathers promised you. So it shall be when you cross the Jordan, you shall set up on Mount Ebal these stones, as I'm commanding you today, and you shall coat them with lime. Mount Gerizim, Mount Ebal, right there in the center is the city of ancient Shechem, okay? This is a narrow passageway, and for the sake of time, I'm just going to tell you the story. What Yahweh said is he said, I want you to go in, I want you to take the Ark of the Covenant, I want you to take half the tribes and I want you to stand on half of them on Mount Gerizim, and I want you to take the other half of the tribes and I want you to stand on Mount Ebal. And he says, I want you to proclaim the blessings, while I'm proclaiming the blessings, I want you everyone to look to Mount Gerizim, and when you proclaim the curses, I want everyone to look at Mount Ebal. Right in the middle between Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim is a natural amphitheater. It's absolutely phenomenal. It's, it's a natural amphitheater. It's a natural like valley. It's kind of off in the distance where the horizon is there. And that's where they stood, right in the valley so everybody could hear, all, all however many there were. A couple of million people. This is Joshua's altar. This was a spectacular, gorgeous altar. Right here between these two mountains is a derrick at Shechem where God's people were there and on one side was the blessings, one side was the curses. He's using visuals to get his point across. Joshua builds, builds an altar, uses natural stones. The limestone is put around it for a reason because limestone is malleable. Ma limestone you can write on. It, 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 you understand what I'm saying? It's a soft stone. You can only write on something that's soft. And he wants to write it on a heart of flesh, vellum, limestone. And he says, I want my Torah to be written on your heart. They departed and they went to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan, the same exact route as the Israelites are at right now. Abram passed through the land of the place of Shechem, I just showed you that, as far as the Teremoth tree of Moray. There it is. So this is the very first, excuse me, very first time that we have someone stopping at the tree of Moray. What happens? The Canaanites were then in the land. 
Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to Yahweh who had appeared to him. Are you kidding me? This is 400 years, ladies and gentlemen, before Joshua shows up with the Israelites in this exact same place. Now see, we don't live in the land, so we don't make these connections. But Abraham, that what, 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 what was the covenant made from? What happened that day? Did he give him a can of Pepsi and say, drink, let's pray, you know. What's that? No? What, what happened that day? Something was cut in two. An animal was cut in two, remember? And two halves, and what happened? Abraham was put to sleep. And he went through the middle, did he not? Right here, ladies and gentlemen. There's a reason that Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim are standing the way that they are. Because they are standing as a witness. 400 years later, the altar that Abraham made and the picture. Why do you think that he had half the tribes go on one side and half the tribes go on the other? And the tabernacle, the temple, the Ark of the Covenant is right dead center in between. Because this is the exact place where Yahweh walked between the two halves. Okay, starting to see a little picture developing here. Uh, I, I hadn't put that connection together. That's why when I, I wanted to put it in here. I'm like, wow, that's really cool. Because um, I had made a different connection, but it goes right along with Jim Staley's talking about there. Do you follow what he was saying? That's where he believes that uh, Yahuwah walked through the, the covenant with Abraham. And that's why the Israelites had to go through it again. They had to walk right through. It was the fulfillment of the prophecy given to Abram. Right? Well, I saw this in the Psalms. Uh, looking at the picture here, that's, this is more of an aerial view of Shechem. It, it sort of looks like, like two hands like this. You know, uh, it's a natural amphitheater right there. Like these two horseshoe shapes there, Mount Ebal. Mount Gerizim, Shechem in the middle, and like Jim said, it's a perfect natural amphitheater. So they could, Joshua could stand in the middle, and he could talk, and the people on the mountain could talk, and everybody could hear each other on both sides. Well, it says in Psalm 60, verse 6, God hath spoken in His holiness, I will rejoice, I will divide Shechem, and meet out the valley of Sukkoth. And the same exact phrase is, is mentioned in Psalm 108, verse 7. So could it be that that might have been a mountain at one time that he just walked through? <laughs> <laughs> and made that little path going up. I mean, if you kind of think of Yahuwah with this train kind of walking through there, <laughs> and, the, and the Israelites had to go right through that same path to, to come in from their exile out in the wilderness. I don't, I don't know about you. I think that's really cool. <clears throat> All right. Um, uh, we see in Deuteronomy 11, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you th this day, and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. But turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which ye have not known. And it shall come to pass when the Lord thy God hath brought thee in unto the land whither thou goest to possess it, possess it that thou shalt put the blessing upon Mount Gerizim and the curse upon Mount Ebal. Are they not on the other side of Jordan, by the way, where the sun goeth down in the land of the Canaanites, which dwell in the campaign over against Gilgal, beside the plains of Moray? For ye shall pass over Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God giveth you, and ye shall possess it and dwell therein. And ye shall observe to do all the statutes and judgments which I set before you this day. There are commandments to stay in Eden, right? If you, there, it's his land. It's not Israel's land. He's got rules for being there. That's why Leviticus 18 and 26 says, Obey him, good to go. Don't obey him, get off my land. I'm the landlord, <laughs> my house rules. <laughs> get out. Uh, and, I, and I'm looking at this, and it says, uh, For the commandment which I command thee this day is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. How many of you have heard it's too hard to keep the commandments? I read this now, and it's kind of like, it is not in heaven that thou should say, <laughs> who shall go up to heaven to bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? <laughs> Neither is it beyond the sea that thou should say, <laughs> who shall go over the sea for us and bring it into us, that we may hear it and do it? <laughs> That's modern Christianity's attitude, right? Yes. 
How many of you have looked at 1 John chapter 2? Starts off, I am writing these things to you, dear children, that you sin not. But wait, wait a minute. I didn't think it was possible to not sin. Wow. You mean? And he says, but if you do, that's okay. You have an advocate. Jesus Christ the righteous, right? Get back up and try again. But how many of you know you spend a, a, a day like this and you're, you're in a worshipful state and you're, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing and then at the end of the day you think, wow, I didn't, I didn't think any lustful thoughts. I didn't, I didn't hate anybody. I didn't steal anything. And you're kind of going down the list. You're going, wow, I actually made it through today without sinning. And you say, well, well if I could do one day, why couldn't I do two days? Or three or four? Or a week? I, apparently it's possible. But what are we taught in Christianity? Well, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. It's too far. <laughs> Who's going to go up there and get it? But the word is very nigh unto thee. In thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it. You know, 119 Ministries did a great video on the Deuteronomy 13 test. Uh, I'm sure if you, you guys are dealing with it too, right? Your friends and family and everybody thinking you're crazy and legalistic and you've fallen from grace and blah, blah, blah. I just say, okay, read Deuteronomy 13 and tell me if your Paul passes it. My Paul does. <laughs> my Paul passes with flying colors. I love Paul. I'm jacked out of my mind about Paul. Because <laughs> Paul finally put it all together. It took Paul, a, 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 an attorney, a scholar, a doctor of the law, who probably had the Torah memorized, and I would say probably the Tanakh, uh, he certainly had a, well, a good grasp on it for sure. One day, Sheila and I were reading, uh, I think it was either Matthew or Mark, early on, and, you know, Jesus would encounter somebody and, you know, heal them or whatever and say, go and sin no more. And Sheila says, well, what if we replace that kind of generic word sin with the actual biblical definition of it, 1 John 3, 4? What's the definition of sin? Transgression. <laughs> yeah, transgression. Yeah, sin is transgression of Torah. So... I thought, well, that's an interesting idea because, you know, here's this woman caught in adultery and he says, I don't judge you, now go and transgress the law no more instead of sin no more. So I thought, huh, I'm going to go to all of Paul's epistles and look up every time Paul uses the word sin and replace it with the 1 John 3, 4 definition of sin. You do that, you have, you <laughs> you're going to have several dozen scriptures written by Paul, the same guy who wrote Galatians. How many of you have heard Galatians put in your face about a billion times? As if that's the only book in the whole Bible. It's like, okay, read Galatians 1 first before you start quoting 3. And then, oh, by the way, here's Romans, and here's every time Paul says, don't transgress the law. Should we therefore sin that grace may abound? What does he say? Certainly not. Put the definition in there. Should we therefore transgress the Torah? Certainly not. God forbid. Paul passes the Deuteronomy 13 test with flying colors. Uh, so and that's on my Facebook page, or you can email me, and I'll send you a link if you want to use that as some ammo. But I was because the heading of the note that I put was, did, is, this, is Paul teaching against the law? <laughs> Here's all the scriptures where he's saying don't transgress the law. Uh, yeah. So we've got to earn, learn a lot of things, don't we? Yeah. See, I have set before you this day... Life and good and death and evil. How many of you have heard that the, the law is death? Right? Based on a twisting and distorting of what Paul said. What did Peter say about Paul? He said, ignorant and unstable. Ignorant and unstable people twist and distort what Paul says to fall into the error of lawlessness. Right? So, I mean, they're just proving themselves foolish if they're using Paul in that way. I've set before you this day life and good and death and evil, in that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. Deuteronomy 30 continues, but if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shalt be drawn away, and worship other gods, and serve them, I denounce unto you this day, that ye shall surely perish, and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land, whether thou passest over Jordan to go to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. 
Therefore, hello, choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. What I think is cool about this is Moses is talking here, and he's, he's making a vow, isn't he? I declare before heaven and earth what I'm saying here. That's why Yeshua said later, heaven and earth, you know, he says not one jot or tittle until heaven and earth passes away. He's referencing the vow made right here. Not one jot and tittle is going to disappear from the Torah so long as heaven and earth are still here. <laughs> that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and thou mayest obey his voice, that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life, and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swore unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. When I first really read this and understood this with the understanding that we now have of Torah, I was struck by some similar verbiage that I saw someplace else in the scriptures, Genesis chapter 2. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest eat freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. He's giving a choice right here between life and death. Choose life. You chose wrong. You chose poorly, Daniel son. <laughs> I mean, if you contrast Genesis 2 with Deuteronomy 30, you're seeing the same thing, right? Deuteronomy, I call in heaven and earth this day against you, or to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, hello, Matwai, choose life. Adam and Eve had one commandment while they're in the garden. They broke it. They got booted out. Now they have ten. Right? And they're going back to the garden. And he's using the same terminology here. As you keep looking into this, uh, Shechem was also uh, a city of refuge within the promised land in Joshua 21, 21. Joshua gathered all the tribes and elders of Israel to make a covenant with the people at Shechem, Joshua 24, 25. The bones of Joseph, which were brought up from Egypt, were buried in Shechem, and the city became the inheritance of the children of Joseph, Joshua 24, 32. The conversation Yeshua had with the Samaritan woman at the well took place at a, at a place believed to have been a suburb of Shechem in John 4, 3 through 42, which I don't have time to get into, but that's a whole other cool story. I mean, you could do a whole presentation just on that. An entire book could be written on some of this stuff. Jacob's well, this is Ellicott's commentary for English readers on John 4, 6. Ellicott says, Jacob's well is one of the few spots about the position of which all travelers are agreed. Jesus passing from south to west would pass up the valley of Machna until, until the road turns sharp to the west to enter the valley of Shechem between Ebal and Gerizim. Here is Jacob's field, and in the field is Jacob's well. So, I mean, here you have Yeshua going down the same route Abraham basically came down and going there, and then he has this conversation with this woman at the well, right? And he's like, you know, this, the whole thing, are you hungry? He's like, man, I've been fed, <laughs> you know? Uh, it's just some awesome stuff right there. Um, then as we kept looking through scriptures like Hosea, when Kevin went through the book of Hosea, I found another thing that kept pointing me to Shechem and the garden, and we see, but like Adam, you broke, this is Hebrew, uh, excuse me, Hosea 6, beginning of verse 7. But like Adam, you broke my covenant and betrayed my trust. Gilead is a city of sinners, tracked with footprints of blood, priests from bands of robbers waiting in ambush for their victims. They murder travelers along the road to Shechem. So here you see another correlation with Adam and Shechem. Uh, I'm, I'm just saying, I think at this point, we can get rid of the turkey <laughs> location for the garden and place it squarely in the land of Israel. And I'm actually quite convinced at this point, uh, when I looked at all this, that it's my firm belief that Abram was led out of sin to Shechem and that Yahuwah made his covenant of promise there and that the Israelites, upon entering the land, had to first stop there, write out the commandments and pronounce the blessings and cursing because this is ground zero in the Garden of Eden. I believe the tree of life was located where Gerizim is right now and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is where uh, Mount Ebal is. 
And they pronounced the blessing over the tree of life, and they pronounced the curses over the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they put a big old altar there with the commandment saying, don't do that again. Don't mess up again. I mean, it's like everything keeps pointing to Shechem and this strange location right here where all these covenants are taking place and all these uh, you know, travelers are going through it and doing these things. That's my belief. I believe that that's where the two trees were located and that Israel uh, is, in fact, the Garden of Eden. And his goal is to get us back there. His goal is to walk with us again in the Garden. Uh, just some other confirming scriptures regarding Israel as the Garden of Eden. We see in Joel chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong. There hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A fire devoureth before them, and, a, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them. They're coming from Babylon that way. And it says the Garden of Eden is before them. They're heading towards Israel. Blow a trumpet in Zion because they're coming. Uh, we see in Ezekiel, Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do, not, I, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for my own holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen, whither ye went. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all the countries and will bring you into your own land. Oh, you mean the United Nations is not going to do it? Huh. The Rothschilds aren't going to do it? Huh. The Zionists aren't going to do it? <laughs> no, I will do this. Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols, and I will cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And ye shall keep my judgments and do them. And ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. And ye shall be my people and I will be your God. I will also save you from all your uncleanness. And I will call for the corn and will increase it and lay no famine upon you. And I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field that ye shall receive no more reproach of famine among the heathen. Then shall you remember your own evil ways and your own doings that were not good, and shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and for your abominations. Not for your sakes do I do this, saith the Lord God, but be it known unto you, be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord God, in that day I shall have cleansed you from all your iniquities. I will also cause you to dwell in the cities, and the waste shall be builded." And the desolate land shall be tilled, whereas it lay desolate in the sight of all that passed by. And they shall say, The land that was desolate is become like the Garden of Eden. And the waste and desolate and ruined cities are become fenced and are inhabited. Again, we see a correlation to Eden. In Isaiah 51, 3, For the Lord shall comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places, and he will make her wilderness like Eden, and her desert like the Garden of the Lord. Have you seen enough proof yet? <laughs> Israel is the Garden of Eden. Now, when people talk about the Promised Land, uh, I did a Google search on the whole land uh, promised to Abraham. This one caught my attention uh, because it's following the same path of the rivers that I was looking at. Where you remember the Pison going across from Kuwait down to the Red Sea as the lower border and over to the Nile, which I believe the Gion was part of at one point, and of course Euphrates. The problem I have with this, however, is where they watered, wandered in the wilderness. I believe that if this is Mount Sinai, uh, where is it? Uh, yeah, right, right, right here, this little pin. If that's Sinai and they wandered in the wilderness, they had to wander outside of the promised land. They, were to go, they wanted to go in the land, but he kept them outside the promised land. So I don't believe that this could be the border because then they would have been wandering in the wilderness in the promised land. So I believe it went straight across from here you know, probably something like that. I believe that that's the full land. That is the garden. I saw this picture online. 
And I just thought it was beautiful. Uh, a picture of paradise with three bright columns of light. Because I believe Adam and Eve originally were created in the image and likeness of God and probably had light suits. That after they took of that fruit, they lost their light suit. And that's why they said, oh, whoa, we're naked. we're naked. This is what he wants to get us all back to. He wants to get us back to the garden. He wants to walk and talk with us. His goal is always to bring us back there. And I'm going to hold out and wait for him to bring me into the promised land that is what we call Israel. Thank you.